Welcome, everyone, to the Coin Brief Podcast, episode number 12. This is your open source for digital currency news. Um, we are your hosts, Sean. And Evan. And every week we talk about some of the most interesting, uh, most impactful news in the digital currency community, uh, specifically often about Bitcoin, the major cryptocurrency player that is uh, making inroads across the world and um, many thousands of people building a strong infrastructure around the cryptocurrency uh, for both industries and for software developers and you know it's it's a it's a new financial revolution basically and it's fascinating to t- fascinating to talk about both the political implications economic implications um, and you know just the impact on regular everyday people so um let's get right into it um biggest story that came out this week uh for bitcoin is the bit license comment period extension um superintendent ben losky of the new york department of financial services issued a statement saying that they have extended the comment period by 45 days the new deadline for the comment period is October 21st, 2014, and uh, it basically doubles the amount of time that people have to submit official comments to the department about the bit license regulations. Um, <laughs> so people are, some people are, you know, saying this is a victory for the community, that we, um, uh, we should celebrate this and use it to to really launch, you know, uh, a, like a new salvo of, of you know, honest, hard hitting, you know, um, uh, rationally supported arguments uh, for, for changes that we would like to see in the bit license. So um, what, what do you think, Evan? Do you think this is this is a victory for us? It may be a tiny, tiny little victory. No, I think it's 100 percent defeat, actually. Um because, see, I don't know, the Bitcoin community, anybody watching this show, probably um, at least knows about the open letter Jim Harper from the Bitcoin Foundation wrote to the New York Department of Financial Services. Um, and if they haven't read it, they've at least known, they at least know about it. Um, and... Jim Harper was probably was probably the first major influential person to ask for an extension, and he said that we should get at least three months. So when I when I saw the news that um, that Ben Lasky when when Ben Lasky said that they were extending the period by forty five days, my initial reaction was, "Wow, it's half of the minimum that the Bitcoin Foundation asked for." Um, and you know the and the foundation hasn't been hasn't exactly been aggressive with um, the DFS. You know they actually I I've, you know dug a little bit into some sources that were provided you know to both me and you last week um, and wrote a response. I wrote an open letter to the foundation where I dug into those in, into those sources they gave us, and um, one of them was a guy, I can't remember his name, but he testified uh, in front of the, in front of the, um, the DFS. And, um, it was, and he actually said that, um, and, and he was speaking on behalf of the foundation. So this was his and the foundation's opinion. He supported uniform global regulation. Okay. So the foundation isn't exactly aggressive towards the department on um, on this regulation and so Jim Harper said we need at least three months to, to digest this information and to respond to it and Ben Lasky was like I'll give you half of that minimum half of the minimum of your demand mm-hmm. so if that's the if that's the DFS's idea of a compromise giving us half of the least amount that we asked for um, then that tells me that they don't really care about engaging with the community they just want the community to think that they do, and in the meantime, they're just going to do whatever they want with the regulation. And that's my take on it. Well, um, they said, or Ben Lasky said, uh, he told CoinDesk that you know 
they've got a whole staff of people who are sifting through these comments that that people email the department and you know they they sort them out into like different um categories of comments like uh which part of the license they're crit criticizing and that you know they're they're actually reading all of them so um do you believe them do you think they're actually reading them or um is it just like a like a is it just a show to to make people think that they care well i'm sure they are reading them but um they're not going to listen to any comments unless uh you know, unless it's suggestions that wouldn't hurt the overall agenda. Gotcha. So, like, if I sent a comment, like, if I submitted a formal response to the department saying that no part of this proposal is good, all of it will hurt Bitcoin, um, and you should just abandon it altogether, yeah, they're going to read that, but they're going to read it and then throw it in the trash. You know? Yeah. It's, I, they're probably doing that a lot. There's, They're probably... They probably have a lot of trash cans just filled with proposals because they're only going to listen to the people if it if it they they want the public to make they want to make the public feel like they're doing something like they're that they're making a, a valid contribution to this regulation. Um, they want to create that feeling with the community, but then you know behind the scenes they're just going to keep doing whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. Because they basically have an agenda, right? Their agenda is to make the license, no matter what. There's going to be a license. It's going to happen. Um, they have in their mind, you know, what they want the provisions to look like. Their their overall goal, you know, they they want to track every single transaction. Um, they don't want uh, Bitcoin related companies to hold profits in Bitcoin. They want them to hold profits in dollars instead. And, you know, that particular thing, the only motivation for that that I can think of is to help out the big banks in New York who, you know, who would love for these Bitcoin companies to hold large bank accounts with the banks with fiat money, right? So, like, the, the department has their own um, agenda, which in, in my theory is mostly to co-opt Bitcoin uh, companies into the banking system and allow banks to, you know, not only get more deeply involved with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, but also to allow um, banks to, you know, to apply all of the um, strict rules and regulations that they have to go through and, you know, crank those up to 11 and then put it on Bitcoin and um, make them deal with it as well. <clears throat> Um, so they've, they've, they've got their agenda and, you know, <laughs> um, when, when Ben Lasky extended the comment period, he also said that, um, like people had a misconception about what, um, some provisions, um, their goal was. He said that, oh, all these people who think that it's going to apply to software developers, uh, don't, don't, don't worry. It doesn't apply to software developers. Um, but the reason people thought that in the first place is because the bit license says that it applies to, you know, um, these virtual currency businesses and that the virtual currency business includes, um, you know, like wallets, wallets for holding Bitcoin. Um, he said that he, there's a direct quote that Ben Lasky said in a New York radio interview where he said that the bit license is supposed to apply to wallets and you can read the the um, document for yourself and virtual currency business includes people who help to secure or hold your Bitcoin you know in that's kind of ambiguous in in the Bitcoin world because people who help to secure and hold your Bitcoin that can be construed to apply to um, software developers like Hive Wallet uh, blockchain wallet, Electrum, I mean, you name it, there's all these. And so, you know, Ben Lasky had to come out and explicitly say in the past week that, no, we're not going after you guys. Don't, don't worry. We don't <laughs> want to, we don't want to hurt software developers, but like, yeah, that's the like problem with laws. Now. That's the problem with laws. You, you, you make it purposely ambiguous or even accidentally ambiguous. 
and it creates so much uncertainty in the entire industry. It's like software developers are wondering, like, wow, is this guy really attacking us with these ridiculous regulations, even though we just make some code for people to run on their computer or their smartphone to hold their Bitcoin securely? So maybe even if it, it, is, it isn't in Ben Lasky's explicit agenda to go after them, the law can still make people think that it's going after them just by how ambiguous it is. Yeah, and that might not have been uh, Lasky's original intent to make the law so broad, um, but then once you give it up to to um, the DFS and it's out of Ben Lasky's hands as far as enforcement goes, um, you know they can interpret that regulation any way they see fit. And so if they if they felt like um, prosecuting a wallet provider one day, then they could do it because the the law is broad enough to allow them to. But, um, you know, I, we, we were talking about agendas, you know, like I even try to give the government the benefit of the doubt here. Um, like a lot of people are saying like, oh, any government regulation is evil because a hidden agenda of control and power and greed and all this. But I think they honestly have our best interests in mind. Um, but that makes them even more dangerous than they would be if they did have a hidden agenda of destroying Bitcoin and maintaining this tyrannical control. Because that means they're probably even less likely to listen to us because um, they think they know what's best for us and that any suggestions we give them wouldn't be as good as what they could provide if we would just get out of the way, right? Because we're not smart enough to take care of ourselves. That's why they're there. So we're helpless consumers. We need protection. <laughs> exactly. Like they genuinely believe that they're protecting us. So um, they're going to be very reluctant to to be flexible on anything regarding their regulation. So, and they're ultimately ultimately they're going to pass something that benefits them the most. Um, and that that's how it always happens when you're dealing with politicians it's it's you lose every single time because they're they're not going to agree with anything unless it benefits them more than it benefits you and that's exactly what's going to happen with we have bitcoin foundation abandoning their original mission and putting all their money into politics we have the chamber of digital commerce coming up with the sole purpose of lobbying governments in the US all this money in the Bitcoin community is going towards, you know, the political machine. Um, but they're engaging in a game that's impossible to win because, the, you know, the politicians and the regulators aren't going to give ground unless they win. And they yeah. they do that because they think that we're too stupid to take care of ourselves and that they have to be there to baby us and make yeah. sure we don't hurt ourselves. What do you What do you think about the theory that, like, maybe... Um, part of the motivation for the bit license is to allow banks to to get their fingers uh, more into Bitcoin, and um, that it's it's partially crafted to benefit not just the regulators like Ben Lasky, who you know wants to appear like he's doing his job well and wants to get a fat salary from the governor, but also that you know um, that banks want to see this benefit them as well. They want to be able to. Um, deal with these companies in New York on a very, very close um, basis. And they, the banks feel that the only way to do that is to um, regulate Bitcoin like they're regulated, you know? Yeah, I mean, definitely the banks would want to profit off this because, uh, you know, they can, they can see that, you know, people are getting rich off of Bitcoin, so why shouldn't they? And... Um, you know the the DFS is just you know it, it, it's just like a, a middle point between the government and the banks so I'm you know I'm sure the banks yes. have like a direct line with Ben Lasky and they're like no, we need you to do this with the regulation we need you to do that with the regulation um, because it'll hurt us this way or, or it'll benefit us that way oh yeah yeah. It's like I'm sure banks I mean, are submitting their public comments as well, and those probably go to the top of the uh, top of consideration for Ben Lasky. Yeah, I mean it's no it's no different from you know any kind of political agency, government agency. 
like if the money's there and banks have a lot of money because you know they're banks so definitely they're definitely they're gonna try to you know spin it so they so they get something from it yeah so um so the comment period is extended to October 21st and following that um at that point, uh, Ben Lasky will release their um, changes that they de- that they decided on. Um, <laughs> like, who knows what they're what they're going to take out? But I'm I'm sure they're going to take out something that you know people hate, and they're going to appear like they're good guys, kind of, because they mercifully took away one of the destructive pro- provisions while re- you know keeping in most of everything else that's horrible. So it's going to appear like a small victory for the community. Um, so then after that, after that change implementation, there's going to be a 30 day review process to review the changes and, um, and allow, actually, I'm not sure if there's going to be an additional 45 days after that to allow businesses time to comply. I think there might be. And then after that, like the regulations will be completely in effect and your business better be complying or else, you know, your all your lawyers in your company are going to be very stressed out and you know there, there's going to be a small possibility that Ben Lasky's agents are going to come knocking at your door, uh, demanding you close down or something or pay a fine. I don't know. But after that, it's going to be official. Um, we're approaching that time very quickly. Um, I, I can, I can see you know poss- one of the possible benefits out of this is if this does make banks more comfortable with Bitcoin. Um, then they're going to be more likely to dump a lot of money into it. And then we can see a price rise afterwards. Um, which, in my mind, I think that might be part of the goal of a lot of these people who have political inclinations. Um, they, they, they know that the banks are highly politicized and highly regulated. And the only way to get the banks on board with all of their you know, billions and billions of dollars is to get Bitcoin regulated too. So I think that's part of the goal yep, as well. Yeah, that that would be dangerous though because um you know, if you get a if you get a large chunk of the bitcoin price determined by uh money from banks, well then you have bitcoin directly tied to the Federal Reserve. You know, you, you know, we know how great the Federal Reserve has been for the past 100 years, so well <laughs> Well then, I mean, well, yeah, not not directly per se, but you know, kind of um, like two degrees of separation. Um, the Feds uh, use quantitative easing to pump money into the banks, give them you know loans at z- zero interest and you know stuff like that. And then from there, if the banks have an have an easy channel for investing into Bitcoin related assets and companies and such then we could see like maybe you know quantitative easing flowing like almost directly into bitcoin which w- that would make the price go up right of bitcoin it would just it would just um more quickly uh lead to inflation yeah it would it would um doing. it would expand the business cycle into bitcoin so we would have these massive increases in in the value of bitcoin people would get rich off of it um but then once the easy money got shut off, uh, like it did in 2008, it would all come crashing down just like the rest of the economy did. And, you know, that would be really bad. Big, I don't think Bitcoin would be able to survive that just because it's so new um, and its foundation is like so sm- is like really small right now. Mm. It, has nowhere, it has nowhere near the support of the, you know, broader economy. So yeah. at the very least, it would increase volatility a lot. Uh <laughs> A, like a lot, you know, it, as much as Bitcoin is volatile right now, just imagine how volatile it could be if you have um, easy Fed money and easy bank money flowing into it and flowing out of it, you know, on a daily basis. Like, holy crap, we, we like imagine volatility on the scale of, you know, one day Bitcoin is worth $2,000, the next day it's worth 2500 the next day it's worth 1500 you know, like this is the, this is the crazy volatility that we might see in the future if um if quantitative easing and fed policy is more closely linked to bitcoin by way of banks and wall street and and the new york department of financial services 
it'll be exciting, right? It'll be exciting yeah. at least <laughs> if people can handle that kind of volatility. It'll be interesting to watch, but definitely no good can come from this kind of regulation. Like we can get it as as painless as possible, but once it's passed, it's definitely going to hurt Bitcoin. Yeah, at, well, to, in, to the, some in the degree, short term, you know, to it, some degree. Yeah, it, just in New York mainly, and and <laughs> like everyone else, we we've talked about this before. Everyone else in the world can just completely ignore New York's regulations and still be pretty much fine, and ignore not just the regulations but ignore people in new york who might be your potential customers it'll be more worth it to block their ip addresses than trying to comply with the bit license regulations so uh, you know it's going to happen either way we need to look at the silver lining and figure out how how we're going to react as a community to it and you know if we're just going to keep doing the same thing um and ignore the regulations or not it's uh it's coming it's coming soon and i'm i'm really curious now to see to see what happens uh in the space um concerning the price mainly if what the bit license um how that might affect the price because we know yeah it's going to stifle innovation we know that um just give us <laughs> give us give us at least a price increase maybe that'd be that that'd be great thanks to the banks yeah, I don't. I really don't see. Um, I don't see that much price activity coming from Bit License. Um, because I mean the the legis the regulation itself doesn't really connect a lot of people. Doesn't really con connect a lot of the Bitcoin price to banking activity. Um, you know, actually, if if uh, the companies aren't allowed to hold Bitcoin profits, they have to like sell at the dollars. Wouldn't that actually generate you know downward pressure on the price? Because you would have all these. Oh yeah. Um, you'd have all these companies in New York. The one I'm thinking about is the ItBit Exchange, which apparently is you know growing. Uh, so you would have that exchange pumping huge amounts of uh, Bitcoin or dumping huge amounts of Bitcoin onto the market. So, but. And yeah. and I don't see maybe like in the future the banks would get really involved with it, which would, um, you know, tie it to the Fed's monetary policy. But uh, um, that's like worst case scenario, like extreme consequence. I don't, I don't really see that happening with this version of bit license. Maybe with later versions and you know future amendments and things like that. Yeah, it'll be interesting. It's interesting to see what yeah. happens. Um, but. In the meantime, you know, we, we have another additional 45 days of comment period. Um, like we've said before, people have to, um, or the, they should, um, go um, submit their comments to Dana.Syracuse at DFS.NY.GOV and um, be rational, be, uh, be a critical thinker, um, make good points uh, about which parts of the license you would like to see changed and why. And if you're if you're actually part of a uh, business that deals in Bitcoin and you actually have you know hardcore reasons as to how the Bit license will hurt you, um, absolutely absolutely list those. Um, yeah. So yeah, still got some time. We got to see what happens. So the the next topic is uh, Ross Ulbricht the um supposed conspirator slash kingpin slash you know um uh leader of silk road the anonymous um marketplace that got shut down last year by the feds um his trial is coming up in november and while he already had uh four or five serious charges against him for operating the website um the government has tacked on three additional charges to his case and um, these charges include narcotics trafficking distribution of narcotics by means of the internet and conspiracy to traffic fraudulent identification documents so with these charges um, these don't really apply to people who aren't involved directly with that crime so basically, the government is saying that uh, Ross Ulbricht personally trafficked narcotics and 
distributed narcotics over the internet and you know and also trafficked uh fake ids through the internet himself um which nothing we know so far no evidence we know so far says that that is even true even if he is the leader of silk road um playing devil's advocate even if he is uh convicted of that like that that wouldn't mean that he himself personally ever touched a single package of drugs or fake IDs. Um, do you, what do you, what do you think about this, Evan? Um, I think, I think they're just, uh, they're basically just trying to cover their bases. You know, they want to make sure that he's going to go away no matter what, uh, regardless of whether or not he actually did it. If he go, if he goes free, um, it would be considered, you know, a victory for the black market, you know, a, a, another detrimental blow to the drug war. Um, so they have to put him away no matter what, or they're, they're going to hurt their image. So that, that's really what all this is. They're just slinging anything they can at him uh, that might lead to some extra jail time. Yeah. Or as a backup, if he doesn't get convicted on the main charges. Yeah, they're just throwing like everything at him. They're throwing the kitchen sink at him, hoping that something sticks. Um, they're 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 afraid, I guess. They're afraid that they that they might not get him with the original charges. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. Um, because you know, why didn't they just? charge them with these things at the same time you know it kind of seems like they're they've been keeping this in their pocket in case they need it um you know in, in case their in case their original charges weren't as strong as they hoped they were they could yeah. just throw this at them um and you know ross Ulbricht's attorney uh, not attorney said that he even he even said the same things that we're saying um He's saying these these additional charges simply demonstrate the government's uh, penchant for converting a single alleged course of conduct into a series or into a set of multiple similar interchangeable charges in an effort to improve its chances of of having a jury overwhelmed by the sheer number of charges agree with the government on at least one. Um, you know, so this isn't just us. You know, two lowly you know Bitcoin riders. This is. Ross Ulbricht's attorney saying that you know the government is just trying to cover its bases. They're they're doing everything they can to put um, DPR away. Yep. Yeah, they've got a lot going against him. I mean, the the original charges were drug trafficking, money laundering, computer hacking, and for serving as the kingpin on a drug trafficking enterprise. So. <laughs> Did he traffic drugs? Did he launder money? Did he hack computers? Well, may, you know, maybe not. But if those charges don't stick, they're hoping that maybe one of the extra ones will at least. And Joshua Draytel notices that. And, like, they, there's no additional evidence that was submitted. Um, that, like, there's nothing else that the defense can can find in discovery that, like, you know, supports these additional charges uh th like the government is just tacking them on as possible like tangent charges that that might kind of be applicable maybe um but then you know, that's for the jury to decide if if they're applicable or not and the jury jury might agree uh a jury is made up of flawed human beings who um often aren't familiar with the complex technology behind things like bitcoin and dark net marketplaces so you know if the jury doesn't understand um these uh these mechanisms uh exactly as how they actually work then it might actually seem to them based on the prosecution's um case that ross Ulbricht did personally you know like maybe send out packages directly from his house or whatever or you know or like take take the computer hacking charge for instance um that's not actually they're not actually saying that that ross himself hacked computers it's that you know things were sold on the marketplace that helped other hackers uh hack computers 
you know, documents and, and stuff like that, that would, that would help them to hack into things. So, um, you know, I guess the defense will just have to try and make that as clear as possible to the jury. And the prosecution is going to do its best to make it seem that Ross Ulbricht himself was so personally involved in all of these things. Um, and it's, 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 uh, it's a weird thing about the U.S. Uh, court system, how, you know, you got, you got these two opposing sides who, like, each one, especially the prosecution, can w try to warp facts in their, in their favor as much as possible. And lawyers are very good at, you know, kind of warping the truth a little bit to, to fit their agenda and um, trying to convince, like, a, a, a panel of, like, ten people or so to agree with them. And if they agree, then Ross Ulbricht goes to jail for yep. probably the rest of his life. And that's that. Well, do you think, um, you know, I just I just had this idea. Do you think maybe that uh, they could also just be trying to scare Ross? Scare Ross personally? Him? Yeah, like scaring him into changing his plea to, to guilty to, oh. so he'll take a lesser charge. Because, you know, they're... They're throwing all these things at him. Like, maybe they could just be trying to say, like, look, we're, you know, we're gonna get you no matter what. You, you could, but you could always like give in to us and work with us, and you know, we'll give you a lesser sentence. Cause they do, you know, they do that a lot. Yeah, you know, I think that that might be part of it. That they're trying to just scare the crap out of him and and see if he would be willing to, to uh, settle or or whatever. But I don't think he would. Uh, every everything yeah. that I've heard from his attorney and also from his mom, like his mom did a really great speech for for the New Hampshire Free State Project, and uh, she's pretty determined to make sure that they do everything possible to to make sure that he doesn't go to jail. They're putting yeah, up like a good this, fight. Like this is this has gone far beyond just like a normal trial. You know, it's it's really become um, an ideological battle. Uh, not just not just um you know but about government tier hate to say tyranny because i don't want to sound like a tinfoil hat guy but right like you know, oppression yeah like like or you know um violation like of civil government, rights government government overstepping its bounds you know it, it's it's just become a real ideological battle uh and so i don't think i don't think Ulbricht is really going to back down because he probably, he probably has kind of has a sense that this is happening in the outside world, um, so he's definitely gonna stand up, no matter what. Yeah, he's he's putting up the good fight, and um, you know, I'll be I'll be watching the trial cl closely. I'm sure a lot of people in the community will be uh, when it starts in on November third. Um, It'll be really interesting to see, you know, I wish we could, we would be able to watch like a TV, like a, a video feed or something like a live stream or yeah. uh, that'd be awesome of the trial. But I don't think that's going to happen. The most we might get in terms of trial coverage is maybe like a, like a daily uh, summary from a reporter who might be in the courtroom yeah. uh, summarizing the events. And they occasionally have those sketch artists who, you know, draw the, <laughs> the defendants and stuff. So yeah, that'll be, that'll be interesting. To see what happens. On yep, November that's 30. coming up pretty soon too. The next couple months. Yeah, Silk Road, Silk Road Saga is still <laughs> playing out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, best of luck to to Ross Ulbricht and his team and his and his family. Um, you know, like a month ago, Roger Ver made that tweet where he said that for every retweet he got, he would donate ten dollars to Ross Ulbricht's defense fund. And last I checked, they had like over 16,000 retweets. So that's $160,000 right there just from, just from one Ray. guy. Yeah. 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 To, su to support him and, and see if, you know, they can defend freedom in this one specific case. Um, hey, you know, Ross Ulbricht, uh, um, kind of a, if, 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 if what he did, um, is if he did run Silk Road, um, that was a really bold pioneering move um, for someone like that to to make such a you know such a like a revolutionary anti-establishment um, uh, website. 
you know, it just it, like his 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 flaws were that he he didn't cover his tracks right and um and he appears to have gotten very rich off it as well. He did shave off a lot of money for himself, and that's one of the things the government doesn't like the most is that he did um make a lot of bitcoins off of that. Yeah, and Silk Road is pretty much where Bitcoin got its start. So that was you know, the thing it was first known for. Yeah. Yeah, Ross Ulbricht is definitely responsible for uh, a lot of things. Uh, you know, regarding the fight against the drug war. You know, individual liberty, and you know, also Bitcoin, and you know, cryptocurrency in general, because Bitcoin has, you know, spawned a bunch of these you know, smaller coins off. Yeah, especially the the ones that are privacy centric, you know, who, yep, who like see the Dark flaws coin. who see the flaws in Bitcoin uh that violate privacy occasionally, how you can track tra transactions across the blockchain if you don't mix your coins. And yeah, yeah, you know, Dark Coin is trying to um address that that vulnerability in terms of privacy. So yeah, I mean this is um you know, when when huge things like that happen in the community, like the government taking down um, a dark net market and seizing, you know, millions of dollars worth of coins, it's uh, it incentivizes other people to to build up new um, you know new barriers or new new patches, new new services and products and new coins that can prevent that sort of thing from happening again. So. It's almost like for every horrible thing, thing that happens in the Bitcoin community, Silk Road getting taken down, um, Mt. Gox crashing, and other stuff is like it just motivates other people to build up something that uh, can replace it in a better way in the future and uh, prevent those bad things from happening again. Self-regulation, like we like yep. we talk about it's sometimes. Free market in action. Indeed, it's great to see this, and it and it's. It's happening, you know, so quickly too. Like this, uh, you know, just in the past year, so many of these services have popped up to um, to alleviate flaws that that were found out, you know, just last year or even early this year. In the case of Mount Gox, uh, shall we move on to um, another topic? Um, so, Amaji Metals um, earlier this week which is a uh, bullion uh, vendor of precious metals, uh, gold and silver and stuff like that, they announced that they aren't going to accept um, dollars anymore as payment, directly at least, for their precious metals, um, starting in uh, you know early 2017 or late 2016, uh, because they have lost faith in... Um, in fiat currency, uh, thanks to quantitative easing, like we mentioned earlier, and inflation by the Fed. So they're not going to accept dollars in, within a couple years. Instead, what they're going to do is they are, um, what is it? They're, they're going to make like an exchange on their, on their website that allows people to buy cryptocurrency with their fiat first and then use the cryptocurrency to buy the gold uh, from Amaji Metals. And then Amaji gets crypto instead of instead of fiat for their for the metals that's kind of an interesting idea right yeah they're not really refusing to accept fiat right because uh they're, they're just saying you can't you can give us fiat but you have to buy crypto from us first before you can buy gold they're they're basically just introducing um an intermediary in between uh in between the cryptocurrency and the gold, like uh, if you if you have fiat, you can trade it for crypto, then get gold. So it's kind of like a it's like a reverse payment processor, right? Like a reverse BitPay or reverse yeah. Coinbase. Yeah. So um, they're still going to be accepting fiat. They're just making you do an extra step before you can buy gold from them. It's basically it's basically well, one, first and foremost, it's a marketing ploy. Uh, they want to be, you know, the first business that says we've lost all faith in the dollar, so we're no longer accepting it. And that two, gets them a lot of press in the libertarian and, yeah, and community. Like, yeah, right. and and two, um, it's a way to spread awareness of crypto because if you got if you have this website that makes you buy cryptocurrency before you can buy gold, 
then that's going to be um, potentially a lot of new people, uh, you know, learning about, about cryptocurrency crypto, yeah. who otherwise wouldn't. Because a lot of a lot of the people in the, in the on the gold markets, um, they they either haven't heard of cryptocurrency, uh, and if they have, they think it's a scam or you know they're like Peter funny, Schiff. They don't it's funny money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Monopoly money. So it could. It's definitely. If it ends up working, like how they're expecting it to, it would, you know, spread awareness. Yeah, it's a really interesting idea, and you know, if if they can if they can make that like a, like an API or something, the the like exchanging fiat to coins before making your purchase thing, like that, you know, that'd be interesting for other people to use as well. Um, like, what if what if a lot of businesses adopted that model where they don't want to accept any dollars at all. You know, they don't even want to bother um, buying bitcoins or whatever with 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 their profits that came in dollars. You know, they just they just want to get all income in crypto. And if there's a way to do that easily and make it easy for for the customer as well, make it easy for fiat customers to basically give you crypto instead for your product. That could be a pretty um, you know revolutionary maybe or at least interesting idea um for merchants to you know crypto loving merchants to get crypto basically from customers who wouldn't otherwise be paying in crypto yeah i might use this the, at some point it pump up the bitcoin price too uh yeah. like it it would have to be this method would have to be used by you know lots of companies because amaji metals isn't um probably isn't big enough to you know have a substantial effect on the Bitcoin price but if you had a bunch of companies that implemented this kind of exchange where you had to um, buy crypto from an from like a mini exchange hosted on their website before you could buy their products um, you know that would obviously drive the price up because you'd have a lot more people buying Bitcoin like imagine if, yeah. if overstock did that like if overstock did that if they said you have to buy Bitcoin before you can buy any of our products you yeah. know that that would be a lot of one of two things would happen. A lot of people would start buying Bitcoin and the price would go way up or overstock customers would just go to Amazon. But right. You know, yeah. they'd have to make it really easy for the customers to not turn them away. Yeah. Like we like we would hope that we would have a lot more people buying Bitcoin, but you know, it could always backfire. Right. Yeah. It's it's hard to force people to, you know, adopt like a different payment system. Um because they'll just leave and go somewhere else. There's a lot of yeah. options on the internet now. They don't have to use Overstock if they don't want to. Yeah, but it's definitely an interesting idea. I'm excited to see how it plays out. So, um, speaking of Overstock, um, they have basically released a list of all of their um, countries that are they're going to allow Bitcoin payments from those countries. Um, so long list. And, um, I think the, the, the service officially goes live on the Overstock International website on September 1st. So starting September 1st, um, basically almost the whole world will be able to, um, buy Overstock products with Bitcoin directly. Um, the, the, the list includes basically, you know, all developed countries, um, even like most Latin American countries, South American countries, um, the only ones that are really excluded are the countries that you know are kind of outcasts in the international community: Iran, North Korea. Um, yeah, and and they really um, Overstock really can't do business with them because of uh, you know laws or trade laws restrictions. Like no, like no business can. No business in the U.S. can trade with those countries, so you know it, it's not it's not something that Overstock is deliberately trying to do. I'm sure if Patrick Byrne had his way, he would he would op he would open his doors to all those countries, but you know it's just he's not legally able to. Right. Even if they're paying in Bitcoin, they yeah. Like basically, U.S. companies aren't allowed to do business at all with with Cuba and and stuff like that. 
but he would yeah you're right he would love to it'd be good for his business that the this expansion itself is going to be great for his business i can see why they're doing it they would love to get you know bitcoin payments from the entire world yeah and um you know we can't forget that a few months ago patrick byrne announced that um overstock would be using three percent of its bitcoin profits to spread bitcoin awareness so hopefully this generates um generates more bitcoin business with overstock and it turns that three percent into a much bigger dollar amount uh you know and then hopefully they won't just give it all to the bitcoin foundation because you know they would just flush it down the toilet but um you know hopefully it would give overstock more money to be able to help spread bitcoin awareness across the globe oh yeah oh yeah that's yeah that'd be great that'd be great um I mean that that basically like it's it's creating like a um like a kind of a side service really from overstock you know get all these payments in bitcoin from globally all these countries across the world and then use part of it to promote bitcoin even more across the world you know creating like a domino effect almost yeah, yeah and uh recently uh it was a, a new story like a couple days ago maybe sometime last week uh they announced that, um, or Overstock announced that they were doing, you know, approximately fifteen thousand dollars a day worth of Bitcoin transactions. You know, in the in the big things, you know, Overstock is a billion dollar company, so fifteen thousand dollars isn't a lot. Um, but considering how new Bitcoin is and how small it is compared to the dollar, um, you know, that's a pretty, you know, that's a pretty decent chunk of money going to Overstock every day in yeah. Bitcoins. And that would have blown people's minds, even just a year ago to hear yeah. that like a major US like online retailer gets fifteen thousand dollars in Bitcoin payments every single day. Like that's that that would that would be a big deal last year. That would be that would be bullish news, you know, last year. Yeah, but but you know, now everybody's like, oh, fifteen thousand dollars, that's nothing. You know, they're never gonna do anything with Bitcoin until they start making like a million dollars a day in profit. <laughs> <laughs> Like fifteen thousand dollars is a lot of money. It doesn't matter who you are. Yeah, that's it's progress. It's progress in the community. You got to start somewhere. You're small when you start out in Bitcoin. Bitcoin is still in its early days, really. Yeah. Still getting adopted. I mean, you know, just think about how old the U.S. dollar is. Like, it's like at least one hundred and fifty years old. You know, Bitcoin is five years old. So. Yeah still so early in this and so many so many people even just regular people are still hearing about it and barely beginning to like learn about how it works and you know there's there's they're good they, they made the choice to take the red pill go down the rabbit hole and start <laughs> learning about this new newfangled cryptocurrency and what it's all about we still have those people who are still learning you know yep. I, I started down that path a couple of years ago and I'm still learning stuff, even now. I'm still learning about, you know, all kinds of stuff about how this works, especially new altcoins that come out. Uh, like, the industry is constantly changing, getting more complex, and there's always something new to learn. That's that's why I like um, being, a, being a commentator, podcasting and articles. Like, I, I, I learn in the process. I learn yeah. more about how this stuff works, and um, it's exciting. It's exciting to do. Yeah, I've definitely learned a lot about um, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general. When I first started writing for CoinBrief, um, you know, all all I knew about was was economics, and I was like, well, I can you know loosely apply economics to Bitcoin and explain some things. But now I actually know a good bit about Bitcoin itself. Um, so, you know, it's definitely it's definitely um, a learning experience, and it's interesting. It's interesting to watch. Um, like just see how much you've grown as far as your knowledge in cryptocurrency is concerned yeah yeah it's a process for for everyone in this community i think like everyone's still learning about these things you still have you still have a lot of people in the bitcoin community specifically who are like very anti altcoin who are like super skeptical of things like ethereum and basically any you know any other altcoin it's like ripple and stellar like they think they're all scams and and uh you know dark coin litecoin redcoin dogecoin like all all these just like 
it's a lot to take in and try and like analyze which ones might be worth something in the future which ones have like a good community behind it um like we have we have nice tools now like coingecko.com where you can go and they have like a there's an algorithm that like tells you which coins are are up right now based on you know price is just one factor but also community involvement developer involvement and and things like that um so yeah like it's it's still a learning process for everyone and, and we're still in such the early days and like <laughs> i'm i'm hoping that like i can be you know within you know five years time that i can be like an expert in this stuff uh basically like know about all the major altcoins you know what makes them all um unique and 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 what their individual potential and features are and stuff like that and maybe even like create my own like decentralized organization on ethereum like <laughs> <laughs> like if i if i know how to or if i can pay someone else to do it you know there's so much potential for individuals in this space like potential for individuals to do stuff that they would have never ever ever had the ability to do if um if bitcoin hadn't come on the scene originally in 2009 thanks to satoshi nakamoto yeah it, it's it's in like it's const it's a constantly evolving community um and really it's it's much more than a community it's a, you know it's turning into a whole economy um like if if you really think about it like if you just compare uh the bitcoin economy to you know the mainstream uh you know fiat economies uh it's just like it's like two different worlds you know because right now in the united states um everybody is talking about you know recovery recovery like we're we're pulling out of the recession finally um, yes it only took but, 6 but years you know, like, you know the the real unemployment rate is, is still somewhere around like 16% i think um and yeah the dow is above 17,000 which is you know record high um but we also they have at least um we we also have lots of inflation regardless of what anybody tries to tell you you know all you have to do is go to the grocery store and you can see the inflation um you know wages wages are stagnant um which is really bad because wages aren't going up and inflation is going up. So that means people are uh, getting poor. Um, but then when you look at the, the crypto economy, uh, it's just constant innovation. Like it's, new jobs are coming up every day that you can get paid in Bitcoin to do. New companies are being born every day. You know, people are getting rich every day. And in the meantime, people, you know, in the mainstream economies are, you know, they're getting very, screwed still. A very small group of people are getting extremely rich while most of the people are, you know, they're either losing their jobs or um, they're not getting, their wages are stagnant, which means they're well, actually yeah. their wages getting are worse stagnant because prices all are going their, up. All of their expenses are going up in price while their wages are stagnant, which means, yeah, they, they, they get yep. poorer. It's a, it's but, you a, know, it's a dynamic the you know the Fed will try to tell you like oh we don't have that bad inflation you know we're actually we actually have less inflation than we would like you know it's under two percent um, you know but interesting fun fact about how um, about how they calculate inflation I think it's the um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics I think that's what the agency the federal agency is called that does the CPI the Consumer Price Index. But at some point in the 20th century, I think it was in, around the 1970s, they actually changed how they calculated the price level. Um, and so, if we use the if we use the old CPI, inflation right now would be actually around 12 percent, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, but the new way to calculate uh, the price level, we have inflation of under 2 percent. So you know that's that's just an interesting thing to think about. Uh, you know. Which which one is right? Which one is wrong? Um, I would argue that all it takes is one trip to the grocery store, and inflation is much higher than less than two percent. Yeah, it's it's obvious to anyone who like actually pays attention to prices and doesn't just you know buy stuff blindly. Like, <laughs> I mean, here's like just one like tiny little example. Like, um, I enjoy hot Cheetos, for instance. Uh, so I, you know, back in early college, I would like stop at 7-Eleven and, and get a bag of hot Cheetos. They had a, you could get like a big, like a big bag like this 
you know, enough t for one person and also to share with some friends, you get a big bag for, like that for like a dollar, 99 cents actually. Um, and, and then, and then they, they, they made the bag smaller, so it's barely enough for one person actually, and um, that was still 99 cents, so it's like, oh, crap, so, you know, you, you get less basically for the same price that you're paying. Then they made the bag even smaller, added more air inside, so that there's like there's less chips in the in the bag t to air ratio, and then increase the price to like one forty nine. So you know that's Yep, a fifty. you get less, you pay more. Yeah, yeah, that's that's inflation right there, and it's like it's it's not it's not. hot cheetos fault it's not the chip company's like fault it's it's their business model to be profitable and they basically have to do that in order to make to keep that prop that product profitable um it's and 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 that's just one tiny little example you can see this you know across the entire economy um things get more expensive and you get less of it or you get a worse product uh that's that's the effects of inflation right there and it's, it's right in people's faces you can't listen to the government saying that the the inflation rate is just one or two percent i mean it's it's obviously bs you gotta you gotta look at the proof in the pudding and see how prices are actually um inflating right before your eyes Yeah, um, like in in any instance of inflation, uh, there's two, there's three, but I can only think of two right now. So the two that I that I can think of, there's two main areas that inflation affects, no matter what, every single time, uh, in a period of inflation, and that's uh, food prices and energy prices. Um, so, but but then also there there can be. Uh, like a, a specific thing that that's affected like in the 90s it was uh dot, the dot com bubble the tech bubble um in the 2000s it was the housing bubble um but what always happens is energy prices go up and housing prices go up and so the and the way that uh the government calculates inflation is they just um they imagine the ideal average household and they just create a budget an ideal budget for that household and and each um Each industry, each type of good, uh, is given is just arbitrarily given a weight to that budget. So, like, you know, they might decide that you'll spend three percent of your budget on food one year. So, um, and the the things that have the um, the least amount of weight added to them is energy prices and food prices, and that third category that I can't think of right now. So, you know, basically, the people who dis who calculate the CPI. they purposely leave out the things that are affected the most during inflation. So that's, that's, that's another fun, fun Mm, fact about inflation nice little for you. cheat. Yeah. Um, interesting, interesting discussion on inflation. Um, so uh, let's move on to, um, I think it's our last topic, which is that um, the Chinese exchange OK coin did a proof of reserves, and uh, they actually have 104% of um, what reserves they're supposed to have in order to, you know, fulfill their debts and obligations to uh, people who use that exchange. That's that's pretty good, right? Um, an exchange actually having more than uh, the amount of money that they're supposed to have. Yep, that means that OKCoin can, like every single person who has a balance with OKCoin can withdraw all of their money and the exchange would still have some left over. So yeah, that's, that's a really good thing. Very nice. Yeah, and um, this, they did this um, in the midst of a growing distrust in exchanges because uh, there's been accusations Um, you know, since Mt. Gox had failed, that exchanges operate like fractional reserve banks. Um, like they don't, they can't always uh, release everybody's funds because they don't always have it. So, OKCoin decided to bring in auditors. I think they, I think they used individual or third-party auditors, and they're like, "Look, we have all of your money plus some, so you don't have anything to worry about." 
Um, and they're also they're also working on a decentralized cryptographic um, account verification system called a Merkle tree system. And it allows individuals to actually verify that the exchange has the full amount of their balance available for withdrawal. So it's wow. kind of like it's kind of like um, an individual auditing system. Wow, that's so, very cool. So yeah, the and there's two other Chinese exchanges that are um, planning on proving their reserves in the near future. Uh, Bitcoin China and uh, Huboi. I don't, I don't know exactly how to pronounce Huobi. that, but uh, yeah. yeah, and and they're all doing this because uh, people are like losing their faith in exchanges, um, even more so considering the recent. We recently had two flash crashes. Uh, the first one was on Bitfinex, and the second one was on BTCE. Uh, and so, and that was likely due. That was likely due to margin. Uh, margin trading and margin calls um, so people are afraid of credit bubbles in Bitcoin uh, they're afraid that especially now that uh, margin buying is becoming uh, popular that uh, the exchange uh, the exchanges are you know giving other people's money to traders so they can borrow it and buy bitcoins and um, so um, would you would you mind explaining a little bit about what uh, margin trading or margin calling is exactly and like how like why that can cause a flash crash okay so uh, margin buying is uh, it's exactly what it's called you buy on the margin you basically um, you you borrow money from the exchange and then you leverage your investment so if you have like a hundred dollars worth of money and you can buy a hundred dollars in Bitcoin well you can actually borrow you know another a certain amount of money from the exchange and buy even more and um, and it's just a loan and so then when you sell you when you cash in on your investment you pay back your loan and you know the idea is you pay back your loan and then have some so you, you can you can borrow on credit and make an even bigger profit is the goal of margin buying uh, but, so it's a way I, for exchanges to make additional money off of their just their spare money um, lying not, around. Not the exchange, not the exchange. The individual investors, because um, oh. the exchange can take money they have, loan it to an investor who then buys Bitcoin, um, and then if they make a huge profit off the off the Bitcoin, um, they pay the loan back and then take the difference. And it and theoretically, what you want is. Um, you want to make a bigger profit than you would have made even after you pay the loan back. Uh, but, but where the flash crash comes into play is that um, the exchange is going to make sure that they don't lose money from this deal no matter what. So they set a price, um, they set a bottom price to where if it, go, it, if it goes below that point, um, then the exchange would lose money because the investor wouldn't even be able to pay back the principal loan. So they set it. They set a point just above that, to where it automatically sells all of that investor's uh, assets that are held in the exchange, and it's just to protect the exchange from losing money. Um, and and this is called margin calling. So what happened with the flash crash is that there were a bunch of people who were buying on margin, and so there were a bunch of margin calls uh, set at at a certain lower level. Um, with Bitfinex, it was at five twenty. So just as a result of natural trading uh, changes in valuations, the price made its way down to 520, and then you had a huge wave of of automatic sell orders, uh, and it was a result of the exchange, uh, you know, covering their asses, making sure they don't lose money from the the people who were like taking loans out. Oh, interesting. So it's it's basically it's a system of it's a it's a system of credit. And um, it helps investors make a lot more money, but it's also really dangerous because things like flash crashes can happen. Yeah, yeah. So are there are there any like um, like any efforts right now to like mitigate that um, that risk of of flash crashes, or to like maybe like cur like curtail um, margin calling a bit, or like is it is it kind of like um, people can choose which ex exchange they go to, and you know. They can choose one that allows margin calling or not. Yeah. Uh, well, for, well, first off, um, Bitfinex and BTCE haven't actually admitted that it was margin calling. 
that caused the flash crashes. Um, I think it was Bitfinex. They actually took to Reddit and was like, no, actually, it was just uh, like a few really large sell orders, and we believe it was manipulation. You know, just playing into the, you know, the already, you know, uh, mm. you know, skeptic. The the skeptics. So like it's, it's not our fault. It's all our. It's all our customers. But yeah, yeah. They're well. They're saying it was manipulation. Just playing into the paranoia. Everybody thinks it's always manipulation when the price goes down. Manipulation um, is just such a vague but, word. <laughs> that can mean a million different things. But you know, the general consensus in the community was that both flat, both flash crashes were caused by margin calling. Uh, what you can do to combat it is, um, uh, you know, major stock exchanges like Nasdaq. Uh, they allow margin calling as well, but they also have. Uh, I forget what it's called. I was reading about it. They have this uh, mechanism in place. To where, um, to where, when you get a big wave of margin calls, they aren't all, all the assets aren't sold at once. Like it, it's like a staggered sell-off, mm -hmm. so you don't have this huge crash. Mm -hmm. um, so you can implement that. The exchanges could do that, and it would it would help. Um, but you you know, like you said, the customers could always just. Uh, decide that margin calling isn't or margin buying isn't worth it it's too dangerous and then go to exchange that doesn't offer it yeah 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 um interesting to see how um, exchanges keep evolving in this uh space so um you know uh bitstamp for example um might be evolving in the wrong direction <laughs> the reports coming out that they might be restricting fiat withdrawals um for like large bitcoin companies who want to with, withdraw U.S. dollars, and like you know, telling it's delaying them, it's uh, uh, tacking on huge fees to withdrawals, like between forty and eighty dollars, and you know, basically being really shady about dollar withdrawals, kind of in the same way that Mt. Gox started being w really shady with withdrawals um, late last year, which inevitably led to their collapse. So now we see that Bitstamp might be going down this path as well, and some people are calling for another um, proof of reserves audit for Bitstamp. They they had one earlier this year and they passed the audit, but um, you know this with recent developments and in, in fiat withdrawal restrictions, we might need another audit of Bitstamp as well because they are starting to act a little bit shady about withdrawals, and it might be because of KM. Uh, um, know your customer um, anti money laundering stuff that they're afraid of 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 that but like even then if if you have established customers who've been you know working with the exchange for a while and they're having difficulty taking out their money um like why can't the exchange give it to them immediately it might be because they don't have the money at that moment because they're doing shady stuff with their reserves yeah i saw about this on reddit the other day it was a guy who uh, he like ran a Bitcoin business and he used Bitstamp as his exchange, um, and he was trying to like he said he had never had any problems up until this point. He tried to withdraw some of money uh, from the exchange, and Bitstamp said, "Well, we can't do it. We can't we can't allow Bitcoin businesses at all to withdraw any fiat. I think it was from our exchange." due to some kind of law. I can't remember what excuse they gave. Um, and then I saw another one. Uh, it wasn't a business owner, um, but it was an individual. He said, if I remember correctly, he said he had about seven Bitcoins in a Bitstamp wallet, and he tried to withdraw them, and, um, and the, you know, the, the transaction wouldn't process with the exchange. Wow. And he, co he contacted uh, customer support, um, and... It's been a month, and the issue still hasn't been resolved, and they're just not letting him have his money. So that's not good. Yeah. So you know these two stories, pretty, pretty bad omens. You know, maybe they, maybe Bitstamp is going gox. Who, who knows? Yeah, going gox. <laughs> that's a new, new phrase. Bitstamp going gox. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is not funny at all. <laughs> I mean, it kind of is, but. You know, uh, for the wrong reasons. Well, I mean, like, when Mountain Gox crashed and all those people lost their money, like, 
I was one of the people who saw that coming like a mile away. Like I was following the Mountain Gox developments ever since, you know, middle of last year when, when problems first started arising. And um, I, I did use Gox. Like when I very first started getting involved in Bitcoin, I used them to buy Bitcoin like through through a third party service like Dwala or something that I used to put in dollars for my bank or something. So I used them a little bit, but once start, stuff started coming out, like, they're doing shady stuff about withdrawals. Like I ain't risking holding my <laughs> bitcoins on there at all. You, you can't rely on some random, you know, freaking exchange from Japan uh, to, to hold your money. You know, they don't make, don't believe any promises they make. Uh, Cause they aren't, they, they just might lie. Uh, if you don't hold your private keys then you don't hold your Bitcoin. So like yeah. now we see the same problems happening with Bitstamp. People got to see the writing on the wall, you know, make decisions based on that and, and, you know, make decisions for, for best of you and the best of your Bitcoins. Yeah. You never use an exchange as a bank, right? Like that's the whole point of Bitcoin is to, one of the points of Bitcoin is to eliminate the necessity of banks. You can, you can securely hold your money on your own without trusting anybody else. So, the you know the just the the idea that people would even think about using their exchange wallet as their primary you know storage space like it just seems really dumb to me yeah it's bad like, like like i'm maybe it's maybe it's because i'm you know fairly new to the bitcoin world i i've only known about bitcoin since 2012 and i didn't become you know really convinced about it until early this year um you know, so after the Mount Gox thing already happened, so I would be like, you know, kind of caught wind of it and then, and, you know, in the news and online on Reddit and things like that. Yeah. So maybe it's just because I came in after all that happened, so it seems like common sense to me. But, you know, like, I've, I would never leave my Bitcoins in an exchange wallet. You know, the only time I put any Bitcoin in an exchange wallet is when I put it in my Coinbase wallet to sell it. And, um, you know, and I sell it as soon as a transaction is confirmed. As soon as it gets six confirmations, I sell it and it leaves my wallet and goes into my bank account. So, yeah, it, I just don't get why people would do that. It's just a bad idea. Yeah, you always you always want a desktop wallet. I mean, that's where you keep your Bitcoins or a paper wallet or a Trezor or whatever. Just don't yeah, keep it on or an exchange. Or a phone wallet, you know, even yeah. that is better. Yeah, it seems like it's not people as who, safe, but it's safer than an exchange wallet because you still have full control over it. Yeah, it's like people who keep a lot of money on exchanges and just sitting there for for an extended amount of time. It's like they're totally ignorant to what makes Bitcoin Bitcoin. You know, it's that the, they just they just see it as like a just an investment vehicle. So why would they keep their investment on anything besides the site where they're making the investments? Like it's yeah. they're totally ignorant to what makes Bitcoin an amazing um, decentralized uh, currency that requires no trust in anyone else. But they willingly put the trust in exchanges anyway. It's, it's yeah. weird. But what really baffles me is that uh, you know people, a lot of people keep all their bitcoins on these exchange wallets, but they don't even get anything out of it. Um, like they they give up full ownership over their money and they're subjecting themselves to the risks of, of getting their funds lost or stolen. Um, you do the same thing with a bank with your fiat, but at least at a bank you get interest on your deposits, you know? Sometimes. Um, yeah. Like, but you don't even get that with an exchange vault. There's literally no incentive to keep your Bitcoins on an exchange. And I just don't understand why people do it so much. Yeah. And they it's keep like, a lot of money too. Like that one guy had seven Bitcoins in there. Yeah. And... and <laughs> It's not that hard to transfer it to a secure wallet on your computer. It, it works just like an exchange wallet, except you have full control over it. Yeah, and it's not gonna. It's, it's not gonna be taken by anyone. It's not gonna be lost in, in a hacking attempt or something, which are still going on. There's still hacking attempts all the time, and some yep. hacking attempts are successful. So we still know that exchanges are points of vulnerability, basically. It's like, you know, people, it's not that hard. The transaction fee is five cents. I mean, come on, just pay five cents to secure your Bitcoins in a, in a local wallet. It's It should be common sense, really, for everyone at this point. Yeah, and, you know, 
the only the, the biggest obstacle you face or the biggest risk you face when you have full control over your own money is you doing something stupid and losing it. Like my like my biggest fear is me doing something really stupid and locking myself out of my wallet or losing my bitcoins or something. You know, but at least I don't have to worry about somebody stealing my money from an exchange. You know, or at least I don't have to worry about a Mark Carpola's junior, you know, taking everything from me. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm I'm responsible for my own money and that's You don't how have it to worry be. about your money going gox. Yeah. And that's that's how it should be. I don't yeah. I don't get it. Maybe hopefully people will come around. I mean obviously they are, they're starting to lose trust in the exchanges. Yeah. Um maybe we need another gox to teach those people a lesson again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would be really bad, but who knows, that might be what has to happen. Yeah, it's 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 just, you know, people um, you know, delegating their personal responsibility away from themselves and 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 trusting someone else to hold their money uh who who might run away with it or get attacked and and lose it if you are if you if you take personal responsibility into holding your own coins then that you know we mentioned the learning process earlier that's also part of the learning process is like learning how to secure your own bitcoins um using wallets that um uh are are secure that um, are useful as well to, for holding your money, um, and you know, tr tr trusting. In that case, like you're, you're trusting the software developers to write good code. Um, you're trusting all the people who look at that open source code on GitHub, um, which, which you know, I'd rather, I would much rather put my trust in very intelligent um, software developers who make useful um, apps and products. I'd rather put my trust in, in them than um, trust in a website of uh, of 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 some guys, you know, some guys who built this website in Slovenia or whatever, which is where Bitstamp, Bitstamp is, and trusting them not to just take everyone's coins randomly, or trusting them to have security, uh, um, uh, cybersecurity enhancements to prevent, you know, another gox from happening. And it's like. I guess, you know, people like Ben Lasky want to force exchanges to, you know, have the ultimate in security and all this stuff. But, uh, you know, I don't, that's, that's too much trust for me. I don't want to trust get regulators. I don't want to trust exchanges. I, I would rather trust myself and software developers and the awesome apps that they, that they create for holding Bitcoins. Yeah, these, these wallet providers, you know, their entire business is based on keeping your Bitcoin safe. Uh, you know, the exchanges, they have a small security team within this whole huge business, which is mostly just, you know, buying and selling things. So, you know, it's definitely worth it to learn how to use a desktop wallet because it's much safer. It's really not that hard to use. Yeah. yeah. Um, and... Also, you got to keep in mind that exchanges are only temporary if if Bitcoin goes all the way. So um, mm, that's a good point. At, so you know, at some point, you're going to have to learn how to use a wallet. You know, better sooner rather than later, right? Oh yeah, that's yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, exchanges. If Bitcoin really does go to the moon and it gets adopted by um, the general public at large. Yeah, you won't need exchanges anymore. There, that that point of vulnerability won't even be like that big of a factor anymore, just by way of of, of total mass adoption. But that's that's pretty far down the line, and um, we we got a long way to go to that point. We're yeah, st we're still gonna be stuck with exchanges for a long time. That uh, you know, and people trusting them to be secure and hold their money right. Yep. Yep. So uh, you know um. I think that pretty much just about covers it for this week's episode um, of the Coin Brief Podcast. This has been episode 12 of the podcast. And um, yeah, I'm Sean. And I'm Evan. So uh, we'll see you guys next week. Make sure to um, check out coinbrief.net. Um, check out other videos on our YouTube channel. Um, click like if you like this video. Uh, you know, um, subscribe as well. And um, you know, follow us on Twitter. Our Twitter names are uh, are, are uh, at the bottom of the video. And 
yeah, that's, that's pretty much it, right? Yep. Awesome, awesome. So, yeah, we'll see you guys next week with the next round of news in the digital currency space. See you, everyone.